Hi, my name is Jeanette Goryeb, and I am the Senior Health Education and Engagement Specialist of Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada, and really happy to have you here for the 2021 Brain Tumor Webinar Series. Our mission is to reach every Canadian affected by a brain tumor through our four pillars, information, support, education, and research. And this webinar series is just but one educational program that we do offer through Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada, so please make sure you do follow us at braintumor.ca or on any social media outlet uh, for regular updates. And even though our office is closed to the public during the pandemic, we are here for you, whether that's through our 1-800 number, by email, by video chat, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and we will get back to you as soon as possible. And um, we have organized these the webinar series a little bit differently this year. Typically, uh, well, we have two presenters per webinar. Typically, it's an educational piece and then a personal story of hope. We're doing the personal story hope a bit differently this year, um, or sorry, this month, I should say. Um, we have, it's more of a research and mentorship webinar uh, with uh, the, both doctors, uh, Sheila Singh and Dr. Branavan Manorinjin. I messed that up, buddy, but I will get it better next time. Um, and uh, we're, yeah, we're really, really excited to have them both here with us. So I will have you both show your beautiful faces on video. Thank you. Um, so let me get you introduced and then we will get started. So uh, Dr. Singh is Professor of Surgery and Biochemistry, Chief Pediatric Neurosurgeon at McMaster Children's Hospital, Division Head of Neurosurgery and Hamilton Health Sciences and scientist appointed to the Stem Cell and Cancer Research Institute of McMaster University. She holds a tier one Senior Canada Research Chair in Human Brain Cancer Stem Cell Biology and is Director of the McMaster Surgeon Scientist Program. Since 2007, Dr. Singh's lab applies a developmental neurobiology framework to the study of brain tumor regenesis. Dr. Singh is currently studying the relationship of BTIC, signaling pathways in glioblastoma, brain metastases, and childhood medulloblastoma, with an ultimate goal of selectively targeting the BTIC in appropriately tailored drug and molecular therapies. She is scientific founder and interim CEO of a startup company, Empirica Therapeutics, a brain cancer therapeutics company that is seeking new data-driven treatment options for patients with glioblastoma and brain metastases. Dr. Menorenjan, a longstanding I got it that time, interest in academic medicine stems from a high school cooperative education placement during which he explored factors that contributed to the neurosurgical management and quality of life of people living with a brain tumor. Upon completion of a Bachelor of Health Sciences honors degree at McMaster University, which by the way, I don't know if you guys remember, that's my alma mater, my undergrad. I love McMaster. Um, he enrolled in McMaster's combined MD PhD program. His doctoral research completed under the supervision of Dr. Sheila Singh, ident identified an innovative treatment paradigm for the most malignant pediatric brain cancer medulla medulloblastoma. Branavan is currently a second year neurosurgery resident at the University of Calgary. His current research is focused on better understanding the immune microenvironment in glioblastoma and brain metastases. He hopes to combine his clinical research, his clinical interest in neurosurgery with an active neuro-oncology research program comp upon completion of his residency training. So Branavan is joining us from Calgary. Sheila is joining us from Hamilton, Ontario. And it takes countless resources to train a neurosurgeon scientist of which mentorship and research funding are of utmost importance. So this presentation, will illustrate the value of Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada's research studentship and how it enabled Sheila to mentor Branavan, leading to exciting discoveries that have improved our understanding of medulloblastoma, the most common type of brain cancer in children. So their presentation is entitled Training the Next Generation of Neurosurgeon Scientists, Fighting Brain Tumors in Two Different Worlds. Welcome to the both of you. Thank you so much, Shannon, for that wonderful introduction. And um, I am so happy to be here today uh, co-presenting with Branavan. I'm only going to speak very briefly at the beginning. You're going to hear mostly from Branavan because you can see uh, the title of our talk is Training the Next Generation of Neurosurgeon Scientists, Fighting Brain Tumors in Two Worlds. And Branavan really represents the next generation of neurosurgeon scientists. And um, I'm just going to share a few um, details with you about my lab, but particularly about the circumstances that brought Branavan and I together. And um, and, and the absolute joy, um, the probably one of the greatest privileges of my career is really, um, has been mentorship. 
So um, next slide, please, Brandon. So Brandon and I have both been extremely lucky to be funded by the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. And in fact, I really, um, not only do I want to convey my deep gratitude to BTFC for everything you do and all the volunteers on the call, um, how much we appreciate you and the work you do. Um, but, but especially, I think, uh, I want you guys to know that the BTFC has really facilitated the ability for us to do high risk, high reward science. So very often you don't have enough pilot data to submit a very large um, grant, but the BTFC really sees the seeds of discovery in, in the projects that are submitted to them. And they will fund things that, that seem very high risk, but hopefully uh, down the road turn out to be high reward. Um, so next, thank you, Brandon. So today um, in our talk, uh, Brandon and I hope to um, convince you that there's huge importance in investing in trainees particularly very early in their academic career. And probably one of the most important programs uh, funded by BTFC is the Studentship Program, which recognizes um, exceptional undergraduate students, um, like Brana Van once was, um, and invests in providing funding to, for them to not even just work for one summer in a lab, but to work for two subsequent summers within a lab program so that they get a long-term exposure and can acquire a deeper and more profound um, understanding of the science within the lab of a, someone who studies brain cancer. And we'd like you to, to understand how multifaceted mentorship is and, and how really critical, as I said, it is to training surgeon scientists because as Brandon may likely tell you as well, neurosurgery is not so much a training program as it is an apprenticeship. There's a lot about neurosurgery where you learn by observing someone who's a few steps ahead of you. And I think that um, form of apprenticeship is something I've actually built into how I run my research program on, on, on the other side. And finally, um, you know, being a neurosurgeon scientist requires two different capacities. Um, there are huge rewards in being both a surgeon and a scientist, but they rely on different strengths of, of your character and they require you to overcome uh, different weaknesses of your character. And just as an example, I'll tell you that neurosurgeons are very invested in uh, short-term gain. <laughs> we love to you know, help a person in a very critical condition and tell them, don't worry, we'll fix you, we'll make you all better. And we rushed into the operating room and we take out whatever mass is pressing on their brain and relieve their, their pressure up front. And this is immensely gratifying. But very often when we solve a problem in the short term, we're not really solving it in the long term. And that's where being a scientist comes in. So I like to say that my neurosurgeon side, I love short-term gratification, but on the scientist side, I have to learn patience and I have to learn um, the, the value of the long-term, uh, the long game, shall we say. And I think Brana Van will probably echo that. It's really good to have two different careers that bring out um, the better parts of your character on both sides. Um, next slide, please. So Brandon assembled this beautiful set of uh, images from our lab program. So the lab that, that I run is based at McMaster University, as Janik said. Um, we started the, the Brain Cancer Research Lab um, here in 2007, and it grew from a very small group um, to now a thriving program. Uh, next slide, please, Brandon that um, we're very lucky now to have quite a large team. And the team again is formed in the spirit of how um, medical teams work together. So if you look at the composition of any medical service or team, it's composed of the very youngest trainees. So let's say on the medical side, that would be um, undergraduate students who are coming to do an observership in a medical setting, to medical students, to residents, and then within the residency training program, you have junior residents who of course are less experienced than senior residents who are almost finished their training. And we have fellows who have completed their residency and now they're subspecializing in a certain area of neurosurgery. And then we have the neurosurgeon. So this hierarchical structure of a medical training team is a beautiful thing, especially in a field that requires a lot of technical training. And as I said before, apprenticeship. So I came to structure the lab. Uh, next slide, please, Brandon. I came to structure the lab in the spirit of how these medical teams are structured. I thought, well, this works so beautifully, having you know the, the senior resident train the junior resident, the junior resident trains the medical student, and everyone works together. And when the medical student makes a mistake, the junior resident owns it and covers for it and says, don't worry, buddy, I got your back. 
And when the senior resident, you know, needs something important done, he can delegate it to his juniors who are loyal and who will do whatever's needed for the senior resident. So I saw the best of those medical teams, even though it's a hierarchy, everyone knows that they're moving up the ranks. And so there's respect for every position built in. And there's also a loyalty to working in a team like that. So I developed three teams within the lab that study three separate types of brain cancer. So you can see here, we've got team glioblastoma, we've got team medulloblastoma, which is where Branavan uh, once lived, and team brain metastases. And the wonderful thing about these teams is they're all structured with a postdoctoral fellow who's sort of the person who's completed their PhD and aiming to be a full scientist and is at that stage where they're almost there. Then you have um, the senior graduate students, senior PhD students who are far, farther along in their training. Then you have master students and junior PhD students, and then you have the undergraduate students. And I thought, why not structure every team so we have people at each level and they can all work together? And it, you'd be surprised at how beautifully it works. Furthermore, the three teams, they have their own brain tumor that they're studying, but you'd be surprised how much crosstalk there is between the different teams. And even Branavan benefited beautifully from that because although he was on team medulloblastoma, he was always keeping an eye on what team brain metastases was doing and inspired by some things they did. And similarly, he made discoveries that were relevant in glioblastoma. And in fact, the same signaling pathway, the effects that he observed in medulloblastoma, he decided to also explore that in GBM and found that even though they were two brain tumors, the same signaling alteration had the opposite effect. And that was just an ingenious discovery. So I think there's a lot of crosstalk between the teams, which really benefits um, the overall generation of science. So next slide. I think at this point, I'm going to turn over to Branavan, but just before I do, I hope Branavan will indulge me and uh, let me tell just a small personal share, a small personal anecdote about Branavan, um, because Branavan, as I mentioned, is the future of um, neurosurgeon scientists. And he, I, I'm not going to embarrass him too much, but he is a remarkable and brilliant person. And I've been very honored um, to participate in his career um, development. And I first met Branavan when he was 15 years old, because the traits that Branavan has that um, position him to be successful in the fields of both neurosurgery and science um, are traits that many of us possess. Branavan um, is incredibly enthusiastic, and he has great curiosity. He would always look at things and wonder why, why is it like that? And that I think is essential to being an excellent scientist. So with this trait, I met Branavan when he was 15 years old as a very bright, um, curious teenager who participated in a program with Dr. Michael Cusimano. He's a neurosurgeon scientist, the only neurosurgeon I know who has a PhD in education. He works at St. Michael's Hospital and he believes so strongly in training and mentorship that he brought in high school students to help with research. And I remember at the time I was a second year junior resident in the neurosurgery training program at University of Toronto. And I thought to myself, what can a high school student do to help me? And remarkably, Branavan was assigned to me then as a research assistant. And trust me, he could do way more even at that age than you'd ever imagine. And he actually helped me to gather data for a paper that I was writing with Dr. Cusimano. So I already knew Branavan was a highly motivated, bright um, kid uh, from early on. When he came to do his undergraduate um, uh, degree at McMaster University, he immediately sought us out and thought, oh, I'd love to work in Sheila's lab. I already worked with her. You know, now she's got a full job, a full staff job, and I'd love to work with her again. But I made him do his groundwork like every other student, and he had to go and learn more about brain cancer before he could join my, join my lab. And he worked with some of the neuropathologists here doing remarkable research and, and uh, you know, gaining a deep knowledge of the brain. And then he joined here as an undergraduate, benefited from many BTFC studentships, ended up um, getting into medical school and doing his MD PhD with me as well. And through this um, relationship that we built working together, we actually developed scientific ideas together. Even though um, Branavan was junior and I was, you know, in charge, so to speak, everything we did was uh, an equal collaboration because even though I mentioned before this training is an apprenticeship, um, the, the master still has a lot to learn from the student. So with this, I think that really this two-way communication is what made our science um, so important and what brought new questions to bear. So at this point, I will sign over to Branavan and tell him again, you know, what a joy it's been to participate in his career. And now I get to sit back and watch him do all kinds of incredible things and say, I trained that guy. <laughs> so Branavan, over to you. 
Thanks, Sheila. Um, so, and you know, as much as this presentation is about the trainee and, oh, sorry, the trainee, uh, it's equally as important to recognize, you know, the training environment that you're in and the mentors that either you get chosen or that either choose to take you under your their wing or that you kind of seek out and uh, kind of uh, follow them along and uh, try and model your career off of them. So I've kind of benefited from both those approaches, I'd say. Um, so I'd start by, um, I'm sure many of you have uh, heard of Malcolm Gladwell and some of you have probably have read the book Outliers. And um, there's a great uh, line in that book where uh, Malcolm Gladwell says that this isn't a book about tall trees, meaning the actual outliers, um, but it's a book about forests. And by that, what he means is the environment in which these individuals became to be who they were and kind of those success stories. It's all about that environment and the mentorship that they would have received along the way that led them to being where they are today. And I think over the course of our talk today, uh, we've kind of broken the talk into two parts, one on mentorship and then the second part on uh, work that we had published thanks to funding that we had received from the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. Um, so uh, in terms of mentorship, uh, for me, it all started, you know, we always think of, uh, you know, we're chatting about what, what it takes to make a neurosurgeon scientist, but there's people along that path that lead you to uh, these surgeon scientists that you end up meeting later down the road. And for me, the first person when I think of a mentor as a young child was uh, probably Father John Pakalskis, who was uh, the uh, parish parishioner at our local church. But we, I had grown up in kind of the inner city where um, there weren't many academic, if any academic role models. And this was kind of the housing complex that I'd grown up in. And Dr. Pakalskis, or sorry, Father Pakalskis had um, recognized that a lot of us young kids, we were either home alone because our parents were working multiple jobs or at often um, us being home alone or not having supervision led to a lot of children getting into trouble that they really did not need to get into at that age. Um, so he actually opened up an after school basketball program for a lot of kids where he would just supervise us, play basketball with us and spend time with us after school until our parents were able to come get us or um, we had some other uh, um, activity that we had to head to. Um, and for me, that kind of, uh, for him to keep me on the straight and narrow at that younger age, um, I definitely owe a lot of uh, my success to people like him who, you know, had the foresight to think of uh, children at a young age and uh, making sure that we had some role model and mentorship. Uh, and for me, when I went off to high school, um, I had a number of mentors that, you know, till this day, uh, we text and keep in touch, uh, probably on a monthly basis. Um, and one of the quotes that I remember from high school was high school is not a spectator sport. And by that, um, what our teachers had meant was, you know, it's for it's up to us to get involved in activities and for us to seek out opportunities. And I think I took that to heart. And uh, uh, Mr. Brady here, who was our math teacher, was also the head of our guidance department. And uh, by no means was I a gifted kid by, uh, I guess, academic standards. Uh, but Mr. Brady kind of saw that, you know, I was very keen and always willing to participate in extracurricular activities. So offered me opportunities where I was able to take um, some junior level courses at a university level while I was in high school and get me intrigued in the biology of cancer. Um, and same goes for Mr. McGarry, who was our science teacher. And most importantly, Mr. Edwards and Mrs. Cutterjar, um, they were my co-op teachers. And they were the ones that really um, set out some time for me in my final year of high school, that entire second semester for four months, I had the opportunity, as you heard from uh, Sheila, that I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Fusimano and thereby meet Sheila. And when I think about outliers and what was that key defining moment that set you up for the rest of your career, uh, kind of like when Bill Gates at a high school age uh, was able to go and code um, and learn all this coding when no one else had the opportunity to do that. Um, for me, I kind of think of that high school co-op placement as my really stepping stone and uh, path that really opened up a bunch of doors and, and continues to do, do so several years down the road. Um, 
I think the one thing that I would comment is that my mentors clearly had uh, did not care enough about my poor choice in hairstyle at that time. So uh, I think that's the only negative feedback I'd give all my mentors in high school. Uh, and so moving forward to my grade 12 year, uh, Dr. Cusimano, as you heard from Sheila, was instrumental in uh, one, opening uh, my eyes to the possibility of uh, academic medicine as a career um, and research uh, and more importantly, neurosurgery. Um, and at that time, I also met Sheila and who's continued to be a mentor till this day. And I imagine well into my career. Um, uh, and, you know, I think that's one of the beauties of mentorship is at some point you uh, become colleagues and uh, it, it, it's definitely the exciting part of mentorship, uh, watching kind of your supervisors recognize you as a colleague and um, working together. And the last person I'd mention is Dr. Kalman Kovacs. And Dr. Kovacs is a neuropathologist uh, or an endocrine pathologist that I met while I was working with Dr. Cusimano and uh, Dr. Singh at St. Mike's Hospital. And for me, um, at a young age, seeing a man who was in his 70s and still as passionate about studying pituitary adenomas, and the pituitary gland is this tiny, tiny little gland at the base of the brain. And although it's super tiny, it has um, kind of wide reaching functions and it secretes hormones that affect our body in numerous ways. And Dr. Kovacs had studied the pituitary gland from the age of 20 until uh, his retirement, which I imagine was uh, several years after this photo was taken, but he is retired now and uh, likely in his 80s or 90s now, but in his 70s, he was still as passionate about studying pituitary adenomas as he was in his 20s. And I think that um, seeing that level of excitement and the fact that he had this infectious sense of excitement that made everyone else around him excited about studying pituitary adenomas, um, those were kind of the qualities that really stood out for me in looking at clinician scientists and seeing how the research they were doing was being translated to patients and there were questions that they were able to ask from seeing the patients and going back to the lab to study those questions. And so what does it take to really become a clinician scientist? And so for me, after four years of my undergraduate degree, I... Um, decided to apply to McMaster's MD-PhD program. And you can see here, the MD-PhD program is a seven-year program, and it's split up into part-time, you're in medical school doing part of your medical degree. And then at one point, you completely stop your medical training and you go into your PhD full-time. And usually that's about four years in length. And then once you defend your PhD thesis, you jump back into med school and you start doing your hospital rotations. You know, you, uh, a lot of people often ask, don't you forget a lot from what you learn here to when you go back to med school? And fortunately, during the PhD, you do have opportunities to see, uh, to follow clinicians on days that you have off and uh, continue to keep up with your clinical skills. And again, I think mentorship, I can't stress how important it is because for a 20, 20, a young 20 year old to commit to something that's going to be for the next seven years of their life, it's quite the commitment. And um, you can imagine this also involves quite um, a, a lot of tuition that you end up paying both for medical school and your PhD. Um, and again, it takes a lot of mentorship and a, a lot of people, not just your academic supervisors, but those who, um, you know, your family and your loved ones to really see the value in what you're doing, see the excitement when uh, you talk to them about the work that you're doing and support you no matter what. And fortunately, again, I was very grateful and uh, blessed to have people in my uh, corners. And throughout my PhD work, um, I was very uh, generously supported by the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. And I, I put this slide up because for those who, you know, we always talk about research taking a lot of time to uh, generate data, and it, it does take quite a bit of time, and it's critical that uh, investments are made in trainees early on in their careers. And for me, I received the Brain Tumor Foundation studentship in 2013, 
And this was a, um, a nice story that the Brain Tumor Foundation had put out on our paper, but this paper was published in 2020. So you can see that, you know, the project that we got funded for was in 2013, and it took about, it took about seven years to get this data generated and put it out uh, to uh, put it out in the public for uh, um, other scientists to recognize our work and um, for us to really say, you know, we've got a pretty solid story that we're quite convinced is real. Um, so, you know, I can't thank enough, uh, I can't thank the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada enough for seeing something in me that, you know, I probably didn't see at that age um, and all those years back. And, um, but it, it means a lot. And ob obviously all that support at the end of the day pays off when we're able to uh, follow through and provide uh, meaningful results for patients. And so for me coming full circle in 2019, uh, this was me at the start of my medical school degree, and this was me at the end of my medical training with my wife and my parents and my medical degree and my PhD. And I think this photo, um, I've actually got it framed, and it's something that I always hold uh, dear and near to my heart. I, um, the work that we had done that we'll be presenting today, we were awarded um, an award from the American Association of Neurological Surgeons, which is arguably uh, the largest uh, neurosurgical society in uh, North America, if not the world. And um, to have that award and to get a photo with both Dr. Cusimano and Dr. Singh uh, meant the world to me because it kind of, you know, it, it displayed where I came from and hopefully where I was going to end up as a surgeon scientist, similar to the two of them. So we'll, um, with that, I guess I'll hopefully have shown you, you know, the value of mentorship and the importance and how many people it truly takes to get someone to the point where, you know, by no means am I uh, near the end of my training. Um, and I continue to have mentors throughout uh, my years in residency, but uh, it, it definitely means a lot to have one, the funding and the investment that the Brain Tumor Foundation has put towards our work. But at the same time, that funding has allowed me to maintain uh, my research relationship and my personal relationship with uh, all my mentors, including uh, Sheila. So with that, we'll start kind of talking about the science of our work. And so when we think of what a stem cell is, um, there's many different types of stem cells, but a couple uh, properties that they all share is this one property called self-renewal which is when a stem cell divides, it can give rise to both a, another replicate of itself, or you can think of it as a twin. And it can also give rise to another cell that is not that is a bit different from the actual stem cell. And that's what cell renewal is. The other thing is these cells, these stem cells divide pretty slowly. By contrast, these progenitor cells that come from stem cells, they divide much more rapidly and then they stop. Whereas the stem cells live inevitably for a long time um, and through this process of dividing very slowly. And eventually through the process of cell division and differentiation, a stem cell can give rise to a more differentiated cell um, that does not divide or proliferate. And so when we think of the human brain, um, work that was actually done at the University of Calgary in uh, Sam Weiss's lab, uh, in the early 90s showed that the human brain actually contains stem cells. And these cells are thought to reside in kind of the subventricular zone around here. And not that these cells look green under a microscope, but they form these balls, which are called neurospheres. And they only light up green here because they've put in a protein, a fluorescent protein that lights up green when you look at it under the microscope so that you can track these cells in uh, space and in time. So by contrast, if we have normal stem cells, could it be possible that we have cancer stem cells? And could they be this evil twin? Um, and so the idea that cancer stem cells exist was initially formulated by work done in Toronto in leukemia. And subsequently, both uh, Sheila and additional labs have shown it to be the case that these cells likely exist in multiple different types of tumors. And so in the idea that this one stem cell that might have a protein called CD133 could in normal, uh, in normal contexts give rise to different types of cells in the brain. 
However, if there is some sort of mutation or transformation event, this normal stem cell can now become that evil twin and start to give rise to um, tumors that result from these normal cell types. Uh, so oligodendrocytes giving possibly oligodendrogliomas, neurons giving rise to medulloblastoma, and so on and so forth. And so this was the work that uh, Sheila had published, and it was seminal work uh, for the brain tumor field because it pretty much kicked the door open and started a whole new field of brain tumor research looking at these cancer stem cells or tumor initiating cells. So if you recall earlier, I showed you those green balls that were normal neural stem cells. And from Sheila's PhD thesis, she found that if you look at a protein called CD133 on the surface of these cells, the cells that have this protein are able to form these spheres or these balls, whereas the 133 negative cells are unable to do that. And then if we were to inject these positive cells into the brains of mice, the mice form tumors very similar to the human tumors. And some of the proteins that we look at, like Nestin, MIB1, GFAP, those same proteins are present in the mouse tumors, which are the brown stains here, um, here, here, and here, which are also present in the human tumors. So understanding that there could be these stem cells in brain tumors, um, while they are present, one would wonder, well, what's the clinical relevance of these stem cells? And hopefully through describing a story of a patient that Sheila had seen in clinic and ended up operating on and we took care of at McMaster, I can give you some or shed some light into the clinical relevance of these stem cells. So um, I'll present Jamie's story. And so Jamie was um, in September of 2010, he initially presented to the hospital with uh, symptoms of nausea, headache, and blurred vision, um, which was concerning for a tumor in his cerebellum or in kind of the little brain behind our big brain. Um, and in between September and November, Jamie received a lot of neurosurgical care involving resection or removal of his tumor, um, which unfortunately left him with some paralysis on the left side, and he was wheelchair dependent due to his um, uh, treatment, uh, uh, treatment plan. And then from December, in December of 2010, he received 31 daily radiation treatments to the brain and spine. And at this time, Jamie was uh, 12, I believe. Um, and from January to June of 2011, he received six months of aggressive chemotherapy. And fortunately, in June of 2011, Jamie did not have a tumor, and there is no tumor present on his imaging. So if we think of these stem cells, maybe um, all this therapy was able to target the stem cells. Um, Unfortunately, what we know is that these stem cells are quite intelligent and they're able to kind of navigate throughout uh, therapy and kind of, uh, if you recall earlier, I said they slowly divide. And if they're slowly dividing in the background, um, some of these therapies like chemotherapy that target rapidly dividing cells may not target these tumor initiating cells. So while his tumor didn't, was not present in June of 2011, a few months later, in August of 2011, his tumor relapsed and um, he received aggressive radiation. He was still able to go back to school in September. He was elected student council president. Unfortunately, in October, the tumor came back and there really was no additional therapy available at that time. And sadly, uh, in December of 2011, Jamie passed away um, in the arms of his parents. And so with the story, well, as devastating as this is to hear, one of the things to take away for us as surgeon scientists is the question why. Um, why did his tumor go away? And then why did it come back um, all of a sudden? And in such a short time frame. And while the tumor responded initially, why didn't it respond the second time around? And so for that, um, I, I'll chat, I'll, we'll talk about medulloblastoma, and that was the tumor that Jamie had been diagnosed with, and that was the bulk of my PhD thesis as well. Um, and again, this idea that these tumor initiating cells may exist and uh, may um, escape therapy and thereby come back with a vengeance after therapy, um, those were some of the ideas that we had in our mind while we kind of uh, carried out our project.
So medulloblastoma, it, um, it, it was first described by James Homer Wright, who's an American pathologist, and it was described in 1910 in this paper by Dr. Wright. And while he, um, while he did not define the term medulloblastoma, he described this tumor that had small round blue cells. And it, was, it wasn't until 1925 when Harvey Cushing, who's considered the father of modern day neurosurgery, and Percival Bailey, who's kind of a Renaissance man who was tr trained in both neuropathology and neurology, together they coined the term medulloblastoma and they wondered, could a medulloblast be the source of this tumor? And what they described as a medulloblast in 1925 was a cell that they thought was a primitive cell or in other words, a stem cell. So it's quite remarkable that even in 1925, without access to modern day technology, people were already thinking of medulloblastoma as a tumor that may arise from a primitive cell or a stem cell origin. And in terms of why we study medulloblastoma, um, so medulloblastoma represents the most common malignant pediatric brain tumor and the leading cause of death among children with cancer. Um, and it represents one in five brain tumors in children. Now, even with high risk children, we've reached about a 70% five year survivorship, which is quite remarkable for a brain tumor. Um, when we compare that to tumors like glioblastoma and brain metastasis, um, five year survivorship is quite unheard of. Um, but the challenging bit in medulloblastoma is that while we're able to get these children to five years uh, tumor-free in 70% of these children, the vast majority of these children are unable to go on to live independent lives, um, go on to post-secondary education. Um, and the reason for that is the significant amount of radiation that these children get in order for them to survive this uh, deadly tumor. Um, and all that radiation ends up leaving these children with significant cognitive deficits. Um, so we still need, while we've come a long way from the days of Cushing and Bailey, we still have a long way to go in terms of identifying targeted therapies that might benefit these children in the long term. And so in the early 2000s, um, there were several research studies from groups all across the world that showed what we thought medulloblastoma was one tumor may actually be genetically very different and may comprise multiple different subgroups. And this was all genetic studies. Um, and all of these little dots represent different genes across different medulloblastomas or different types of tumors. Uh, within that uh, region uh, in the cerebellum. And so finally, uh, Michael Taylor's group at SickKids in Toronto showed that conclusively that what we thought was one tumor actually consists of four different subgroups. And these subgroups, what's interesting is that the Wnt and sonic hedgehog groups, these two subgroups, both these pathways are cell communication pathways that cells use to communicate with one another and in normal development. So they're active in stem cells. And interestingly, they become reactivated in cancer, um, such as medulloblastoma. And unfortunately, we still don't know exactly what pathways cells use to communicate in group three and four tumors. And that's still an active area of research. But what I'll draw your eyes to is in this Wnt subgroup of medulloblastoma, a significant proportion of these children still get metastases. And these are um, uh, tumor cells that go from the brain and coat uh, the layers of tissue that cover the spinal cord. And often when children get metastases in medulloblastoma, there really isn't any targeted therapy aside from increased radiation for these children. What's remarkable is that if you look at all the other subgroups of medulloblastoma with metastasis, the survival is not all that great. Whereas in the Wnt subgroup, these kids all survive remarkably well, irrespective of the fact that they may have metastases. Um, so that led us to wonder that could medulloblastoma uh, represent a tumor where a possibly a CD133 cerebellar stem cell that resides in this region of the brain where these tumors are formed, over the process of self-renewal, 
uh, the stem cell giving rise to more aggressive subtypes like the group three and group fours, whereas maybe a differentiated progenitor um, can give rise to some of the less aggressive subgroups. And really medulloblastoma is a tumor where you have a beautiful model of stem cell biology or developmental biology to, uh, to apply for uh, really studying uh, this tumor. The other interesting thing with uh, the Wnt subgroup of medulloblastoma is that in all other types of cancer, if you have activation of this pathway, it leads to really poor outcomes. But for some reason, in children with medulloblastoma, you actually have really good outcomes in kids with activated wind signaling. And so that also made us wonder, is there something about the biology of wind signaling um, that could alter the stem cells in medulloblastoma and lead to really good outcomes in these children? And I've, I know I've mentioned WINT a few times now, and I'll just briefly go over what this pathway is. So there's a, one cell that will secrete or make this protein called WINT, and this protein will go and bind to its receptors on another cell. And when it binds to these two receptors, frizzled and LRP, it activates this other protein called disheveled, which inhibits this whole complex of proteins. And when, the, when this complex is unable to function, it allows another protein called beta-catenin to start to accumulate inside the cell. And when it accumulates, over time, it's able to get into the nucleus and bind to some other proteins to activate genes. Whereas if you don't have this uh, uh, Wnt ligand being bound to the receptors, then this destruction complex is able to function. And in, in functioning, this part, one particular protein, GSK3, is critical in that it will um, add some important markers on beta-catenin that will lead to the degradation of this protein so that it is unable to get into the nucleus and activate genes. So if we think about normal stem cell biology, what does wind signaling do there? And beautiful work done, um, again, uh, work done in Toronto has shown that uh, activation of um, normal neural stem cells, if you, sorry, if you activate wind signaling in normal neural stem cells in mice, depending on the location in which you activate the stem cells, you'll have very different effects. So if you activate Wnt in stem cells in the forebrain, um, you actually see an expansion. So you see more green, and this is SOX2, which is a marker of stem cells. You see more of these cells. And again, compared to the image here, you see an expansion. And again, compared to the image here, you see an expansion of these SOX2 cells. Now, if you were to activate wind signaling in cells in the cerebellum, which is where medulloblastoma grows, in normal development of the cerebellum, if you activate wind signaling, you actually lose these stem cells. So remember I was showing you these balls of cells. When you activate wind, you actually get less of these. And you also change the differentiation potential of these cells. Um, they no longer form both astrocytes and neurons, which is quite interesting. So clearly there's a different response in the brain to wind signaling depending on where the pathway is activated. So that led us to hypothesize that if we were to activate wind signaling in uh, that activated wind signaling would reduce stem cell self-renewal, that key property of st stem cells, reduce tumor initiation, and hopefully decrease the overall tumor burden in uh, pediatric medulloblastoma. And so this work was uh, published not too long ago in Nature Communications, and uh, we were fortunate to have quite a bit of uh, media coverage based on our work. And uh, again, uh, we'll go through that now in a bit more detail. So if you recall, I said that medulloblastoma has four different subgroups. And so one of the biggest challenges in the field of medulloblastoma is growing the cells that we get from patient tumors in a Petri dish. These cells are unlike some other tumors like glioblastoma and brain metastasis. These cells do not really like to grow in a Petri dish all that well. Um, and so a lot of the studies in medulloblastoma have been based on transgenic mouse models where people have put mutations in the brain in different cell types of 
uh, uh, in different cell types in the brains of mice and seeing how those form tumors. But we know that you know a mouse tumor is very different from a human tumor. And so one of the nice things of working in Sheila's lab was having the opportunity to study the biology of the human disease and using mouse models as just a model, but really going back to the human tumor for all our investigations. So having said that, we were fortunate enough to have three different types of cell lines. And these are tumor samples operated from patients that we were able to grow and culture in our lab. So this BT853 is a Wnt medulloblastoma line. Um, this NB002 line is a line of a group three medulloblastoma that we collaborated with people from Stanford to obtain and was taken from a child who received radiation therapy and unfortunately passed away uh, from their medulloblastoma and the sample was taken at autopsy. And then ICB1299 is a group four medulloblastoma. And both the group three and group fours are tumors that are quite aggressive that we still don't have great therapies for. So using a marker, again, a protein that lights up green in cells whenever the Wnt pathway is active, we were able to validate that our Wnt medulloblastoma line truly did have high levels of Wnt signaling compared to our group three and group four lines, which had very low levels of Wnt signaling. And so if we injected both our Wnt medulloblastoma line and our group three line into the brains of mice, and these are human tumors injected into immunocompromised mice, we were able to show that the Wnt medulloblastoma tumors form very tiny tumors. Um, you can see here in the dark purple, whereas the group three medulloblastoma tumors form quite robust and large tumors. And that was seen with a changes in overall tumor size, and more importantly, a change in overall survivorship, which is replic replicative of what we see in patients where Wnt medulloblastoma patients survive and do much better than group three medulloblastoma patients. And so one of the genes or two of the genes we were interested in, while we saw this effect, we wanted to know, well, is this effect due to us affecting the stem cell self-renewal genes? And so what we saw was, in fact, it was. Um, so uh, both BMI1 and SOX2 are two genes that are activated in medulloblastoma stem cells. And what we saw was when we uh, look at patient samples, patients with high levels of BMI1 and SOX2 uh, tend to do poorer than patients with low levels of BMI1 and SOX2. And if we look at our different medulloblastoma lines, the Wnt, Sonic Hedgehog, or group three and group four lines, the more aggressive lines had higher levels of these stem cell genes compared to the Wnt line. And so going back to that Wnt pathway, this protein uh, GSK3 is quite critical and same as beta-catenin. Beta-catenin is the protein that ends up getting into the nucleus and activating cells or activating gene expression. So we wondered, what if we were to overexpress this protein in cells, what would happen? And so if we overexpress beta-catenin in our group three and four lines, we saw a decrease in the sphere formation, so those little balls. And we also saw a decrease in tumor formation compared to our control mice. And again, decrease in tumor size. And more importantly, we saw again, an increase in overall survivorship. So using that model of medulloblastoma where maybe a stem cell gives rise to all these different subgroups, we wondered that maybe there's a possibility that even though there's a group three medulloblastoma, earlier on it may have contained cells that are, rep that are representative of the Wnt medulloblastoma, but over time different cells outcompeted the Wnt medulloblastoma cell and therefore that gave rise to the group three line. So what we did was a fancy uh, genetic experiment called single cell RNA sequencing, where we were able to look at the gene expression profile of individual cells um, within different types of medulloblastoma. And so here we kind of just show that, that Wnt, all the red cells are cells that are positive for Wnt expression or expression of this pathway. And so even though we have a group three, um, two group three and two group four lines, these uh, other non-Wnt medulloblastoma lines still have activation of the Wnt pathway. 
So that led us to wonder, well, can we isolate these cells from non-wind tumors that actually express the wind pathway? And we were able to do that using a reporter, which allows us to identify those cells. And then we we're able to say, show that within a tumor that, has, that is thought to be a non-wind medulloblastoma, the wind active cells actually have decreased levels of the stem cell self-renewal genes compared to the bulk of the tumor, which actually has um, uh, much higher levels of these stem cell genes. And what if we were to inject these cells into mice? And again, I think in every paper, there's a few critical experiments that either make or break your story. And I felt this was one of those critical experiments that really showed the power of our work where we were able to show that these wind active cells actually form much smaller tumors compared to the wind inactive cells. And both of these cells are from the same tumor. That's a non-wind medulloblastoma. And there's an increase in survival. And when we go back to patient samples of medulloblastoma, if we look at group three patients that don't, that have, and we separate these group three patients into patients with high wind and low wind, the wind high patients actually have a much better survival compared to the wind low patients. And lastly, we wanted to make all of this clinically relevant. And one of the challenges in neuro-oncology is identifying compounds that can cross the blood-brain barrier. And fortunately, just around the time we were approaching this part of our story, there's a paper published in, a, in a science signaling where they used a wind agonist small molecule to cross the blood-brain barrier in a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. So collaborating with that group, we were able to use that same compound and show that that molecule was able to cross the blood-brain barrier and lead to a decrease in tumor formation compared to our control mice and also lead to an increase in overall survival among multiple different types of uh, non-wind medulloblastoma. So lastly, I would just, uh, uh, I guess overall what our story showed was, you know, there's the possibility that pathways that are active in normal medulloblastoma, in normal development become reactivated in cancer. And in the right context, some of these pathways that we always thought were oncogenic or cancer promoting, in the right context, they may actually be tumor suppressive. And that's kind of what we found in our story with medulloblastoma and wind signaling. And uh, I, I always really love this slide that Sheila put up. And these are all the mentors that Sheila had as she went through her training and continues to uh, collaborate with some of these folks. And um, I think it, it's kind of full circle in that, you know, these were the folks that uh, generated uh, Sheila as a surgeon scientist. And, you know, she's been paying it forward with uh, mentoring the next generation of scientists. And I always like this quote in that, you know, if uh, hockey's our sport, then uh, stem cells is our science. And so hopefully to recap, um, uh, hopefully we've shown you all that we've recognized that to recognize the importance of investing in trainees um, early on in their academic career, even if the fruits of the, that investment may uh, come several years after the fact. Uh, mentorship is a multifaceted approach. And for me, it's uh, while I've had excellent surgeon scientists as my mentors, there are many other people that got me to that point, And uh, I owe a lot to all of them. And lastly, uh, through our story, hopefully we've shown you how surgeon scientists can translate uh, findings that they see in patients in the cl clinic, as in medulloblastoma with Wnt, where those children do really well and going to the lab and figuring out why that is, and then seeing if we can apply that biology to other patients and seeing if they also benefit from uh, the same uh, pathways. And lastly, uh, as you would all know, none of this work is possible without the mentorship and support of your supervisor, but also um, all the members of the Sing Lab and all the people that have so graciously supported our work and uh, specifically the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. And, uh, and that's it. And I'd uh, like to thank you all. And uh, uh, if there's any uh, questions or anything that people would like to contact us after we're done or offline, uh, we're more than happy to chat with folks. Thank you so much, Branavan. Thank you so much, Sheila. What a beautiful presentation and what a beautiful story because it's so inspiring. Uh, the mentorship that you have provided to Branavan and so many other students, Sheila, is just really heartwarming. 
And Brandon Van, you and I first met, I think, back in 2013, 2014, when you were an undergrad as part of SABCUR, right? The Student yeah. Advancing Brain Cancer Research. Yeah, so it's just really great to see how far you've come with your education and your career. And we're, we're proud to say that we're part of that. So I know Sue Ripers is online as well, and I'm sure she's beaming from, from, from ear to ear. So if anybody has any questions or comments, you can add it to the Q&A. I'll give everybody a minute or so. Uh, I don't know, Sheila, if there's anything else you wanted to add? Well, no, I just wanted to say, uh, Janik, thank you so much for the opportunity to present, but I think everyone can see why I'm so proud of Branavan. So Branavan, thank you. That was just beautifully done. <laughs> Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, both of you. It doesn't look like there's any questions coming through, but if anybody does have any questions, uh, feel free to send them directly to Branavan or Sheila or myself, and I can get them to the two of you as well. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, um, please uh, go to our website and register for the virtual brain tumor walk. Check out the rest of our 2021 uh, Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada webinar series. Uh, we have another one coming up in May and June, and then we'll take a break until the fall. And uh, right when we close off on this webinar, there's going to be a survey that'll pop up. So please take a moment to add your comments. We always share comments with the presenters. They always like to hear feedback from our community. And um, yeah, thanks again to your collaborative approach, uh, Sheila, and for sharing your knowledge, both of you and your expertise with our community. So we're really excited to, to collaborate with you. We are too, Janik, and thank you to you and BTFC for all of the support. You're welcome. Take care, everybody. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye.